Hello. So I'm going to talk about MEV on Ethereum uh, layer two. So I work mainly on uh, fee markets and MEV on layer one. Uh, but lately I've been very interested um, on what's happening on L2 uh, for mainly two reasons decided to talk about this. Like one, uh, it's a very interesting design space that is different from L1 and I feel that it's underexplored. And two is obviously very important for uh, Ethereum scaling. So a rough uh, outline, I'm first uh, gonna talk about uh, the properties of like mature and sound rollup that I will define. Then I'm gonna talk about two types of MEV on layer two. One I call macro MEV and the other one micro MEV for reason that uh, will become clear. And then uh, um, I'm gonna discuss some ways to mitigate um, uh, this, uh, both, both of this. So uh, first I want to introduce this concept of like a safe and sound rollup. So essentially like, uh, we want some properties uh, for uh, these rollup systems, and um, uh, the first type of properties are like uh, mainly security properties that like a mature rollup inherits for the L1. Uh, these are like reorg resistance, data availability, uh, validity, and uh, eventual censorship resistant. Uh, and there is mechanisms uh, for this that uh, different rollups are implementing. For example, uh, force inclusion give gives you event, eventual censorship resistance, but it doesn't give you like the real time censorship resistance, the type that was um, even discussed uh, in a previous talk. So, but uh, really like um, we want sound rollup. So like we just don't want the security that they need for, from L1. We also want like some um, other properties that initially I was gonna call like uh, economic fairness properties, but uh, fairness is a little bit um, loaded term, so maybe I'll call them uh, economic equity. But essentially what you want is that uh, one property is real-time censorship resistance, so like, um, I'm going to define this uh, shortly. Uh, the other one is rent resistance. So what is real-time uh, censorship resistance? So uh, you want uh, user transaction to uh, get included in a timely manner. Uh, compatible with the honest behavior, um, uh, the honest operation of the system. So in particular, uh, the operator cannot arbitrarily delay a transaction causing uh, an economic harm to the user. So the other property is rent resistance. So user should pay the minimum cost compatible with efficient operation of the system. And uh, in particular, it should be impossible for the operator or a third party to extract SRNs. rents. This is the usual um, argument for like uh, MEV also on the one. So um, before uh, going in detail uh, into like uh, these properties and how they relate to MEV, I'm just gonna introduce this stylistic uh, model for like how I think uh, about roll-up system. So you have this system, um, uh, the L2, where like there is a separation of roles um, uh, between the operators of the system. So here we have sequencers uh, that are responsible for um, uh, building blocks or like sequencing transaction and they post uh, the block or the data batch to L1. Uh, then proposer who's responsible for executing and updating the state uh, root on L1. And then um, the provers that essentially check validity uh, the proof may be optional for um, uh, optimistic rollups uh, while it's required for ZK rollups. And of course, the set of smart contract on L1. But then there is other parties. So like there is governance, which essentially is the structure that uh, is um, designing the L2 system and uh, upgrading potentially uh, uh, the L2 system. And then of course there is users that in a rollup uh, centric world, they interact with the L2 system and then they'll eventually be secured by L1. So essentially like users are kind of like the key actor uh, here in this like uh, economic flow for both like, especially when we look at economic properties such as uh, real time censorship resistance and rent resistance. So. Here, essentially, I'm going to break down like uh, the costs that the user incurs uh, when uh, he sends uh, a transaction on the L2. So like the user pays some L2 fees uh, that include um, some um, 
uh, operational cost that uh, in some way will be paid to the operator of the system. Uh, then there is uh, the data cost that uh, is paid to uh, the L1 whenever data is posted. Uh, then there is the congestion cost, which is coming from the L2 congestion fee, which is necessary for uh, essentially like um, resource allocation, efficient resource allocation, uh, allocation in the system. And then uh, there is this thing that I call macro MEV, which is essentially the MEV that the operator can extract for, uh, from manipulating fees. Uh, and then of course, uh, beyond the L2 fees, uh, the user can, uh, may incur some additional economic cost uh, uh, from like transaction ordering and extraction. So this micro MEV is like uh, transaction ordering is like what many talks have focused uh, on. Uh, and I believe uh, in the next talk, uh, Ed will focus specifically on transaction ordering on L2. So I won't focus much on this, but I just wanna mention that um, essentially like um, a, a couple of uh, short remarks, let's say. Uh, so uh, first one is that essentially like uh, the operator that has control over the order of transaction uh, has opportunity to extract value from user. And uh, uh, the way that like so far these L2 systems have been instantiated is a bit different uh, from uh, layer one. So like um, early instantiation of uh, rollups, uh, they enshrined uh, time-based uh, ordering. Um, which uh, it's um, a very opinionated way of ordering transaction. Uh, and uh, it seems that now like um, uh, some of them are considering market mechanisms or at least hybrid market and time uh, based mechanism that uh, are a bit more flexible. So like they reduce the um, uh, incentives to like engage in latency arm race to some extent, not fully. Uh, then uh, they can potentially scale better if one wants to decentralize um, uh, the sequencer role. And then uh, they open the door for a more flexible extraction and uh, redistribution. Uh, for example, like uh, there could be like a supply chain and like other mechanism being deployed. But what I really wanna, wanna focus on is uh, this macro MEV. So like uh, what the operator or other parties can extract by um, uh, essentially mani manipulating the fees. And there are essentially three main ways um, that I think uh, uh, this can be done and like uh, we need to guard against. So the first one is uh, indirect fee manipulation. So uh, anyone uh, can manipulate the fee by increasing the volume of, of, of transaction or decreasing the volume of, of, of transaction in case where there is a mechanism uh, where a congestion fee um, uh, dynamically updates. Uh, and um, uh, this type of manipulation can be different to attribute. So like potential solutions for this uh, in the case of L2, essentially is like about the design of the congestion fee and how it gets allocated. Um, and another interesting uh, one that I will talk about that is not available on the L1 is um, governance could decide some incentive compatible contracts uh, to raise the cost of uh, increasing um, or decreasing volume uh, for the operator. So the second one is uh, direct uh, fee manipulation by the sequencer. So here essentially there is like a principal agent problem between uh, the governance and the operator. So. Um, why do I think that uh, this is um, kind of relevant uh, in the L2 case while well, we don't talk about this much uh, on L1? Is like the L2 fee is more complex than the L1 base fee and uh, usually the L2 systems are less decentralized uh, than uh, the L1 system. So uh, in some cases they're centralized and um, essentially like uh, the sequencer has more power. So Essentially, like on the complexity aspect, um, the, um, uh, the L2 fee is essentially like two main parts. Like one is the data fee and uh, one is the congestion fee. So the data fee like needs to be estimated in advance uh, because um, usually like the majority of the cost is incurred at a, la a later time. And essentially like there is algorithms or heuristic that try to estimate both like the cost of the transaction in terms of gas 
and also the price that will be paid for each unit of gas. Um, and then uh, the congestion fee, um, it's also under the control of um, uh, the operator. So essentially like, there is a bigger surface to like uh, either um, manipulate like the fee entirely, but uh, this may be taken care of with some observability, but there is also like um, uh, the potential to discriminate between user one um, given like uh, access to full information of how this system behaves. Uh, so uh, potential solutions is uh, uh, again like uh, related to like uh, writing contract between like uh, the governance layer and the operator. Um, or um, another way is like set up observability and remediation where like in the case of like a small uh, operator set, for example, like a committee um, can uh, um, uh, be essentially related to governance or uh, one could try to decentralize more uh, to have more guarantees and maybe needs to set up some in incentive in a proof of stake type protocol. But again, like uh, here, uh, this uh, essentially the roll up becomes uh, um, uh, tends to like the L1 uh, setup. Yeah. Uh, so the final um, um, type of manipulation I want to talk about is like uh, a fee market design manipulation. So essentially this is kind of a community governance principal agent problem or like some people call this a governance attack. So the governance has the um, ability to change uh, the parameters of the fee market. For example, like uh, if you assume that like this roll-up system is using like an EIP 1559 uh, style fee. Uh, the governance could like uh, increase the uh, target or the limit and um, uh, essentially like uh, in theory they could artificially limit uh, capacity or fail to update uh, with like uh, in response to increased demand. Um, so essentially uh, this is something that uh, can potentially raise the cost, increase the rent, depending on how the fee is allocated. So like potential solution for this is transparent, participated, and uh, aligned uh, governance, and uh, essentially like flagging free ma fee market changes as um, high stakes decision that may require like uh, some increased um, uh, governance process uh, to be passed. Yeah, so essentially like uh, this is kind of a summary of like the potential manipulations and um, I guess uh, my main uh, goal was uh, first to uh, essentially like uh, highlight that uh, security and economic equity risks for rollups are very different than uh, the base layer. Um, and that rollups inherit L1 security uh, but in order to be sound, they also need to mitigate real-time censorship parent destruction, which they cannot inherit from the L1, uh, they need to manage. And then uh, it seems a common principle, a common design principle is the separation of roles um, in this system. Uh, and then uh, maybe like the other main message is that uh, each problem has more than one solution path. Uh, it's a different uh, design uh, problem than L1 because like um, on top of market mechanism, there is also governance. There is like service agreements with operator and decentralization is, uh, let's say a tool in the pocket to achieve uh, these uh, economic equity properties, but it's not the only one. Uh, so um, in particular, when adapting some of these solution, like there is a performance security trade-off that uh, the operator of this system need to take into account. Thank you.
Hey, David. <laughs> uh, great talk. Um, you see a role for a rollup's own token in these attacks that you describe? Like, does it prevent rent extraction or censorship resistance? Or does it prevent censorship? Or does it maybe enhance uh, these things? Yeah, I mean, like, um, the rollup native token is usually used as governance token. So definitely, like, uh, maybe referring back to Phil's talk about like uh, power decentralization and the fact that it's kind of the most important in the uh, hierarchy of like uh, decentralization. If there is uh, extreme concentration in the governance token, then like the type of attacks uh, such as the governance attacks that I described maybe uh, may become more likely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, yeah, so definitely. Uh, I feel that like in governance systems, uh, we are at the early stage of research. We are employing like uh, some mechanisms that uh, seem uh, okay, but they are like not very sophisticated. So um, it seems that is a theme that recurs in roll-up, in staking. So probably like uh, we need to devote some more uh, time and research to that. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Um, do you have any thoughts about Besides the MEV attacks on governance that you mentioned, do you have thoughts about the ways in which the activities of governance could expose MEV? Mm. Can you say more around like um, uh, who would uh, be able to extract MEV like uh, from these governance activities? Yeah, so I'm wondering about particularly votes in which that are highly valuable. Oh, ah, okay, And okay. so, you know, there's this action that will be taken on chain that will expose value in a way. Mm. Um, I'm wondering what the MEV dynamics around those votes going on chain might look like. So uh, you are um, thinking about potential even markets for votes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I haven't thought about this much, uh, but uh, it's definitely like another uh, direction that like we can imagine that it will be there if these governance decisions are high stakes. Like uh, I just was highlighting one of them related to like free market, but yeah, there is potentially many others. Okay, thank you, Davide. Cool.